Okay, there we go. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm sure we're going to continue to have uh, people join us. Sounds like we have about 60 people uh, registered this afternoon. So um, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Basehart, and I'm the Executive Director of Independence Now, which is the Center for Independent Living that serves uh, Montgomery and Prince George's counties. So uh, welcome to the I Am session, Independence Amplified Maryland. As I was reflecting, we've been doing these sessions since late spring 2020 and have been thrilled to host lots of interesting topics and speakers and get out good information to people across Maryland. There are often four or five centers for independent living represented on any given call. So if you're looking for our services, you're welcome to drop your information in the chat so that people can connect with you as there's centers from all over involved. Um, today, uh, we are going to hear from Ian Edwards. As one quick, sorry, a couple quick reminders first. We are recording the session. And so there, it's posted on Image Center's YouTube after, in a few days, after captioning gets finished and so on. But we um, encourage people to remember when asking questions that you probably don't want to share lots of personal information because these are then posted on YouTube. If you have really personal things to get into, we would want you to uh, talk later with a speaker or or one of us if you're looking for our services. Um, our, you will be muted and we ask you to remain muted during the presentation so that everyone can hear the speaker. When it's time for questions, you are welcome to raise your hand or put them in the chat or I'll offer a time for just to unmute and ask a question in case none of those other options are accessible for you. So we'll make sure we can get everything answered. And our next, we've moved to a just about every other week uh, session for these IM sessions. We used to previously do every week and we've moved to every other week. So our next session is the 24th of January and that will be Disability Rights Maryland speaking about um, a sidewalk and accessibility lawsuit that has come up. So that will be on the 24th of January if you want to register for that session. As you know, we ask you to do that in advance so we can send you the Zoom link ahead of time. The information for captioning has been put in the chat. If you just joined, you're welcome to click on that if you uh, so need. So I'm going to introduce Ian Edwards now, our speaker. Ian works for the Maryland Department of Aging with the Durable Medical Equipment Program called Reuse, um, and he is the director of that program. So he's going to talk with us. This is a statewide um, equipment reuse program that he's going to speak about. I am really happy that lots of the staff from the Centers for Independent Living across Maryland are here because we are likely to be a big referral source for you, Ian. <laughs> And so I'm sure both of people who call us and have equipment that they want to get rid of and call us and need equipment. So we probably have both kinds of referrals we need to make to your to your program. So um, I'm going to let Ian take over. He has a PowerPoint presentation and I'll mute myself now. Thanks, Ian. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Great. So it's great to meet you all virtually. Again, my name is Ian Edwards. I am uh, the director of the Maryland Department of Aging's Durable Medical Equipment Reuse Program. Uh, I'm also a doctor of physical therapy. And uh, today um, I was, I've been welcome to share more about our program. Uh, I'd love to share more detail about uh, information about how our program works, the many great components of the program and the few ways that you can interact with the program. And the goal is so at the end of the presentation today, um, you have a, a better understanding of exactly how you can interact. So immediately following this presentation, um, if you'd like to donate or receive equipment, you know exactly how to do so. I've given uh, uh, this presentation quite a number of times, um, so I've implemented many of the questions I've gotten along the way. So it's likely that if you have a question, I'll likely answer it throughout the presentation. Um, but in the end, I'm happy to take any questions uh, following the presentation. So what do we do exactly? Uh, the Maryland Durable Medical Equipment Reuse Program is a first of its kind program uh, that a state government has taken on and where we collect donations of uh, new or gently used durable medical equipment, home medical equipment, or mobility aids. We then sanitize and repair each item as needed, and then we provide them back to Maryland residents across the state. We serve residents with an, any illness, injury, disability, medical status, regardless of their age, and we provide our service at absolutely no cost. 
So the purpose of our program is really two-sided. There's the equipment distribution piece and the donation collection piece. The most obvious benefit is providing equipment to, to Maryland residents in need. Our program is designed not only to help uninsured residents, but also individuals who have insurance, but are experiencing delays in coverage or those who are in a waiting period between when they learn they need equipment and when they can actually get their hands on it, or even individuals who need equipment that may not be covered by their insurance at all. Our goal is to close that time gap and provide DME to improve their mobility, allow them to live safely at home, or even navigate the community or uh, return, the work if that's, return to work if that's what they wish to do. Now, early on, we knew that assisting Marylanders with improving their mobility would be a great service, but what we didn't initially realize was the tremendous positive environmental impact we'd have with this program. When we started collecting donations, we realized that most of this equipment was on its way to the landfill, and we played a role in diverting this DME from landfill by collecting it via donation and reusing it. To date, we've collected uh, over 200,000 pounds um, or 103,000 cubic feet of medical equipment. So, so you can visualize this. If you imagine seven, uh, seven to eight standard three-bedroom homes. Now picture uh, eight of those three-bedroom homes. Picture filling every room from floor to ceiling with durable medical equipment. That's how much space we've diverted from landfills um, to date. Um, in the form of durable medical equipment. And our plan and hope is to, to keep improving that over time. So not only are we helping Marylanders, but we're helping to, to make an environmental impact as well. Now I've been mentioning it throughout this presentation, but what exactly is DME? You really don't know. It's not, not as common unless you work with it. DME stands for durable medical equipment, which is defined equipment that one, in, uh, it serves a medical purpose. Two is durable, meaning it can withstand repeated use and thus be reused and three is appropriate for use in the homes. The common types of DME that we collect via donations and then distribute, uh, we break up into two categories, basic durable medical equipment and complex durable medical equipment. The simpler basic medical equipment is often the items that you'd see at a CVS or a Walgreens. These are the, the mobility items such as canes, crutches, and walkers, uh, shower equipment like shower chairs, tub transfer benches, bedside commodes, and rollators. And then we have a complex durable medical equipment. Complex meaning that um, it's either more complex and that it's, it requires some training to operate um, or that simply it's heavier and bulkier, bulkier equipment. This includes power wheelchairs, power scooters, uh, mechanical lifts, commonly known as Hoyer lifts, um, and home hospital beds. So now knowing what durable medical equipment is, how does our program actually work? How do we operate? Once we collect a donation, we eventually transport all of our donated equipment back to our reuse center, which is a 51,000 square foot uh, DME headquarters, which houses the majority of our operations. Uh, this headquarters is located in Sheltonham, Maryland, which is in Prince George's County. So essentially we have multiple sites around the state, um, but all equipment makes its way back to our, we transport it all back to our reuse center um, where it is first sanitized. So we sanitize each item to national standards using a three-step sanitation process. Uh, the third step being a full cycle in one of our hub scrubs. Uh, pictured here is hub scrubs. I always say that it looks like a NASA spaceship, like we're sending a wheelchair to the moon. But we're not doing that. We're keeping it here for Marylanders. This is a specialized durable medical equipment cleaning machine. Uh, it uses a chemical and ultraviolet light and a, a wraparound high pressure spray system to clean and disinfect equipment. And we, uh, we developed all of our san sanitation um, procedures during the height of the pandemic and we're maintaining all those standards throughout. So a very in-depth sanitation process. Following sanitation, all items are inspected for safety and general function and then are repaired if needed. And now even if we get, uh, you know, that power chair, the wheelchair pictured here that, um, you know, it might have a, an, uh, a motor that's non-functional, we're still able to break down equipment and cannibalize them for parts and then use those parts to construct fully functional devices. And then after sanitation and repair, equipment is matched to its new owner. And these are a few of our uh, recent happy clients using their devices. Uh, a power chair was able to allow one of our clients to, to go to the beach, to, it, the power chair raises so they can see over the railing so she could, she could enjoy the views of the ocean, as well as um, uh, here a Maryland veteran who was, out, uh, was hoping to go to return to senior centers when the pandemic opened and go see some museums. And so we were able to provide her the mobility through a, through a scooter in that way. 
Now, once we provide uh, a piece of equipment to its new owner, we want to ensure they're able to use it safely. Often as a physical therapist, I see um, you know, previous patients who um, had a cane or a crutch or a walker, but they didn't use it simply because sometimes they didn't know how to use it or it wasn't sized correctly. So to mitigate that, we built a mock bedroom and bathroom setup here at our reuse center where individuals can trial their device in a safe environment before taking it home. Again, for those individuals who are, make it, who are able to make it to us. For those individuals are, are, who are not able to make it to us, as an additional means of providing more direction on the use of each type of equipment, we also provide hard copies of instructional material and make videos available on how to use each device safely, um, how to maintain the device, and how to make minor adjustments. So pictured here on the left is one of our instruction sheets. Uh, this has written material and language, um, again, that describes how to use the equipment, how to size it, some tips and tricks on it. And then um, on the right here is a video sheet that includes um, links. So you can type in a URL. Um, if it's a PDF version you send you, you can click on the link. Or if you're savvy with a smartphone, you just scan the QR code and a video will pull right up on how to, on how to use that specific piece of equipment, how to size it, in some cases, how to go up and down stairs. Um, so some additional material um, for those individuals who we don't have face-to-face -face contact with. So as I mentioned, the hub of our operation, the Reuse Center, is located in Prince George's County, but our goal is to make this service available across the state for both distribution and donation collection. To do this, we've set up collection containers at various county landfills, represented here by the blue icons. Uh, some of our county landfills are located in Harford County, in uh, Talbot County at the Midshore Landfill, Anne Arundel County, two locations in Baltimore City, and as of this week, not pictured here, there's an additional site um, in La Plata in Charles County at the, at the Pisgah uh, Recycling Center. On the other hand, um, we wanted to make uh, this service available for distribution, so we've also set up uh, what we call satellite sites, which are extensions of our program at partner institutions. These are um, indicated by the red and yellow icons. These are locations where individuals can both uh, drop off donations to donate or pick up equipment for use. A detailed list of the sites currently open and each site's operating hours can be found on our DME webpage within the Department of Aging's website. Um, or you can call or email us to ask more questions about exactly where you can donate along with the hours as well. So now that you understand a little bit more about the program, what's the actual request process like versus determining who is eligible? The recipient or who we call the beneficiary of the equipment must be a Maryland resident. And that is essentially the, the sole and, and primary eligibility requirement. Again, we provide DME to Maryland residents with any injury, illness, injury, illness, or disability, or medical status, regardless of their age. Though we're the Department of Aging, we have a pediatric equipment all the way through older adult equipment, and we provide our service at no cost. However, since our program relies solely on donations, um, we have a limited inventory of equipment. So as such, we prefer that um, our service is reserved for those individuals who have um, exhausted other means of attaining DME. So in other words, if an individual has insurance coverage, uh, we ask that they first attempt to attain the DME through their providers. Um, and then in that case, again, if there's a gap time in between when they request it, when they can actually uh, receive it, if there's immediate need, or if it's not covered in, by insurance at all, we're happy to assist during that period of time and provide the equipment that they need. Um, we just ask that they take those normal steps to attain it if they have the needs to. Because after all, our goal is to be able to support Marylanders with a defined need and continue to do so as, as long as we can into the future. Now, once, uh, once an individual, a Maryland resident in need of DME is identified, uh, the first step now is to complete a request form. So to officially request equipment, we require a one of two of our request forms to be completed. Um, as I noted before, we have basic durable medical equipment and complex medical equipment. We have a form for each type of equipment. So if you needed a, a simpler device like um, a walker or a rollator, you complete a basic DME form. If you needed a more complex uh, piece of equipment like a power scooter, power wheelchair, a mechanical lift or a home hospital bed, you would complete a complex durable medical equipment form. The only difference between those forms is that the complex form has an additional page, page three. That uh, page three must be completed by the beneficiary's healthcare professional. So this piece is required um, and it's very important to us because it ensures that the right device is being uh, selected, the sizing is appropriate, and that there's the correct follow-up training on that device. 
Uh, many times with a more advanced device like this, there's a, there's a little bit more uh, complex um, healthcare history going on with it. So we wanna make sure that we're um, you know, providing the appropriate equipment at the appropriate time. To uh, retrieve one of these forms, all forms are available on our website. Um, you can follow the link to basic or complex DME. Um, the, the basic DME form as of this week as well, this is great timing. Our, our basic request form is now available in a full online format. So if you go to our website, you can start to finish, complete the whole form online, or alternatively, um, you could download a, a PDF of the both basic and complex DME form. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have access to a printer, or you prefer to complete um, a form by hand, just give us a call or shoot us an email and we can mail a, a hard copy of that form to you. So multiple ways to attain the form and complete them. Um, all the information is there available on our website or um, any other questions and, and how to navigate it with any other limitations, feel free to give us a, a, give us a call or shoot us an email. Could you give me the telephone number? Sure, great timing. We're on the last slide now. <laughs> Lastly, for the sake of keeping this presentation brief and relevant, um, our service is now, now available. So if you know of any individuals who may wish to donate or receive equipment from our program now or in the future, please encourage them to contact us directly uh, or visit our webpage for additional information. And with that, thank you very much uh, for your time and attention um, and opportunity to share more about our program. Um, here I'll read our, our phone number is 240-230-8000. And our email is DME, like durable medical equipment, period MDOA for Maryland Department of Aging at maryland.gov. And that's spelled out. Now, our, our, to uh, visit our website, um, we're at uh, aging.maryland.gov. This will bring you to the, the primary Department of Aging webpage. And then if you click on program and serve, programs and services at the top of the page, we're the fifth program down, the Durable Medical Equipment Reuse Program. Alternatively, in Google, I think if you type anything related to DME reuse, we're the, the first search the result that'll come up for you. But um, again, with any other questions, feel free to reach out. And if anyone has any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ian, that uh, was great. Yeah, um, Hold, yeah, on Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Um, let's see. It says iPhone Elliot, you had unmuted. You, you got the, did you get the phone number? I just want to make sure that you got that. Yeah, I did. I did. Okay. Just, okay. Uh, before I, before I let you go. Okay. Chi, okay. Did you have a question for Ian Edwards from the Maryland yes. Department of Aging? Uh, yes. Do, do, do you, you work with, uh, seniors or do you work with people with, uh, disabilities also? Like, you know, people that are in wheelchairs or paraplegics. Absolutely, we work with the, the only eligibility requirement is that the individual who needs the equipment is a Maryland resident. Regardless of their disability or age, we're, we're happy to help anyone. Really? Oh, that's nice. All right. Really. Betsy, I'll did you? Up. Thank you, Chi. Okay, that would be great if you can share the information. Betsy, did you wanna go ahead with a question? You have your hand up? I did. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, Ian. Um, I am the um, Assistive Technology Program Manager for ARI, which is the Center for Independent Living that services Howard and Anne Arundel County. And um, I refer a lot of people over to you, um, but your location is a little bit of an issue for people picking items up. Um, I, I know you have a couple other sites, neither of which are close to Anne Arundel or Howard County. Um, I, and I did talk to somebody who you actually dropped something off at the loan closet of Howard County and they were able to pick it up there. Is that something that you do on a, um, that you'll do on a standard? And would you bring something to our location in Glen Burnie for people to be able to pick up there? Or, you know, what kind of alternatives do we have without somebody having to drive all the way down to PG County? Sure. Great question. And, and that was one of the, um, the primary goal of the program is to make it accessible. Now, we don't have the resources to provide direct delivery. We can't deliver equipment directly to homes, um, but to, to mitigate that and make it more convenient, that's why we set up these satellite sites. So we have these sites around the state and essentially what will happen is, is when, um, say Ian, I, I'm a Baltimore city resident and I call 
and I could use a wheelchair. Um, we'd receive the request form from Ian, and then we would uh, call Ian and say, hey, we have the, the wheelchair. It seems like it will be a good fit, but it seems like that'd be a far trip as well to drive from Baltimore City. So what we do is um, we'll transport that wheelchair to our satellite site, uh, which is the Waxer Senior Center in Baltimore City. So Ian would have to only have to drive a shorter distance to pick up that wheelchair. Speaking to you directly, we do work, one of our satellite sites is the, the loan closet of Howard County. So um, for Howard County residents or with, with any, when any individual requests equipment, we have that conversation after we check the inventory and pull that equipment and we say, what's the most convenient pickup location for you? And then during our next trip to that site, uh, we will we'll transport that item to, um, for example, the loan closet of Howard County. Um, but again, we're not able to provide um, direct uh, deliveries of equipment. The only other limitation in that is that for the complex durable medical equipment, like power wheelchairs and power scooters, we're only able to distribute those items currently from our main headquarters, from our reuse center. And that's because um, before distributing those items, they require a, a little more hands-on training. Um, and that's so someone knows how to safely take home that power scooter and power wheelchair until they get face-to-face -face with their you know, physical therapist, occupational therapist, or other healthcare provider who they work with to request that piece of equipment. And that's just more from a safety standpoint. So they're more comfortable with that piece of equipment before using it. Gotcha. Thank you. Does that answer everything, Betsy? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Sarah, okay, so there was a question in the chat yeah, from just, Carol. Just, just going to do it. Okay. Um, so a question in the chat was, first of all, exclaiming, what a great program, and then asking, what, how do you sanitize equipment such as power wheelchairs? And you did speak a little bit about that in and show the picture of the scrub hub, but maybe maybe this person just didn't hear that, see that part. Do you want to just, you got to unmute yourself and then, yep. Thank you. Sure. Um, we use a, a three-step sanitation process. So everything is initially um, sprayed with a dis disinfectant um, and then all items are power washed and then placed in our hub scrub, which is a specialized durable medical equipment cleaning machine. For any pieces of equipment like a power chair um, that are not waterproof, like the motor, we'll break down those components and run them through that same cycle um, for the waterproof components, for the non-waterproof components, we'll simply just wipe all those down and disinfect them by hand. Great. Okay. Um, John Michaels, you have your hand up. Did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes. For your, uh, I think you said your complex uh, durable medical equipment, uh, power chairs, things like that. What if the individual has the equipment and something happens that it breaks down or things like that. How do you guys go about trying to help like fix those or anything? Sure. Um, recently how we've done it is essentially if, if there's a, you know, someone has a power chair that somehow broke down sooner than we inspected, uh, we'll, we just ask for them to, to return that chair and we'll give a new working one. And then we'd, uh, we do our best to then internally repair that chair and see if we can get it back to someone else. Is that good, John, or was there more to your question? No, that was great. I was just wondering how they would do that. Okay, yeah. Thanks, John. Great. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, oh, Joan. <laughs> Joan Romanap has a question. And then I, I have actually, one. Hi, this is Joan from ARI, and it's not a, a question. It's actually a comment. I just wanted to say that, Ian, I was on the other side of things where you all came in and picked up equipment that was no longer needed. And it was just a, a fabulous way to give back. And, and also, you all were very, very um, accommodating and, and picking things up and, and uh, setting times and saying, put it out by the curb. It will be great. Um, so thank you very much for that. Great, happy you had a great experience. Thank you so much, Joan. And, and for everyone else too, um, we have these donation collection centers um, and this is great, thank you for reminding me, Joan. We have these donation collection centers where you can drop off this equipment, um, but we understand some of it is hard to move. We are able to make direct um, curbside pickups. Um, it, it does take us a week or two um, to get there just to, to get it scheduled, but we can do um, curbside outdoor pickups for those larger pieces, pieces of equipment. That's great. I know all the, I know we get lots of calls and I'm sure all the centers do, you know, with people who want to give equipment. When you start to take stair glides, we'll be ready to have a special conversation with you because those are the calls we get when we, people have stair glides that they want taken out of their house. And 
um, but they are very difficult to match up to another house. So that's what we have found. Carol has a question. Go ahead, Carol. Yes, um, I just have a comment that um, when my mother-in-law was in a comprehensive uh, uh, retirement community, when she was in the medical unit, I noticed that back in a, in a far end of, of a hallway, there were probably 20, 30 walkers, wheelchairs, all that stuff that was just piled back there. So I wonder if you've reached out to some of the comprehensive uh, care retirement communities or other nursing homes to see whether they've got a pile of them somewhere. Thank you, Carol. And, and that was our exact thinking. We learned the same early on. So many of our, our bulk donations come from uh, nursing homes, assisted living, CCRCs for that exact reason. Oftentimes they, one way or another, they end up with, you know, bulk amounts of this equipment. So that has been one avenue that we receive equipment. So we were on the, the same thinking. Thank you, Carol. Well, I just, I imagine one thing is going to come up with, um, social service staff, including ours, you know, who will be making referrals. I understand the application and needing a healthcare professional. We, you know, often need that for other things. Um, but the piece that I'm wondering how you are asking people to prove to you that they have gone through their insurance first, um, because that's what your slide said was that you were asking people to go through their insurance first. Um, is there, is this just a, we're taking your word that you're being honest, that you've tried to get this through your insurance and you can't, um, how, how specific and detailed is that? Sure, great question. Um, no part of the, the on, our, on our form, we asked some questions about it. It's mostly for data collection purposes and it does not exclude you from receiving equipment at all. Our goal, uh, so developing the program early on, we wanted to, reduce the number of restrictions we had overall. And we hope to place no restrictions. If it ever came down to, to the scenario where there was a, a minimal supply and increased demand, and we were fine that, you know, for some reason, individuals were, for whatever reason, abusing the program, if they had the means and they got the equipment or sold it, whatever it might be, it might be that a restriction that may have to go in place is requiring a denial from insurance. But this is all for data collection purposes. And so those individuals who have the means to attain it. And so the program can be used for those individuals who have no other means or who have that time gap. So um, asking those questions, we, it does not exclude anyone from uh, receiving equipment at all. Uh, like I said, just more data collection purposes. Got it. Uh, one more question was put in the chat. The name of this person is not on there, but it says, do you work with wheelchair repair companies to let them know if repairs will be very long that folks may be able to get something from you? That sounds more like a borrowing situation. I'm not sure whether that's something you're doing. Sure, and I'm just reading the question again so I have a better understanding of the question. I think it's that, you know, sometimes you have to put your chair in the shop and it can take months, you know, for your wheelchair to get repaired. And so you're literally left, you know, with no chair for a long period of time. Sure, absolutely. We don't work directly with the companies, but in those cases, we understand that, you know, oftentimes whether it's uh, through insurance or not, you're left without a mobility device and that's what we're here for. So, so in those times to where you no longer have the device that you need, come to us and we're happy to provide it in that case. And um, unlike many of the loan programs, when we provide a piece of equipment, we don't require it back in any period of time. Once we give it to you, it's yours to keep. It's your property. We just ask that if you no longer need it, please redonate it back to us so we can help another Marylander. Terrific. And then can you send me your slides so that we can distrib distribute them? Thank you. Um, that way folks get all of your contact info and info on the program. Okay. Any, oh, Cheryl has her hand up and then in, 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 in about one minute, I'm gonna have to, as soon as Cheryl's question gets answered, I'm gonna have to turn things over to Katie Collins Erke who's handling se uh, the second part of today's show. Go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah, so I was just wondering, um, a lot of times when people make donations, um, it's to 501c3s and they're used to getting like a receipt for, you know, to write off on their taxes um, and you're a state agency. Um, so I wanted to verify like whether or not that would apply. 
Great question, Cheryl. We um, a donation to our program is considered a charitable donation, so we are able to provide donation receipts. So um, we can do that both with a direct pickup. Our driver can leave a donation receipt or a pickup at one of our sites. Uh, we're happy to provide a donation receipt for tax purposes. Great, that's interesting. Um, all right, I think that's it. Unless there's anyone else. Yep, Pauletta. Go ahead, Paula. You didn't have yeah. your hand up. Go ahead. I, I thought I did. I see a little image here. But at any rate, uh, hi, side. Ian. It's nice to, nice to actually see you. I've sent several people to you. I'm uh, with the um, assistive technology program with the Freedom Center. Now, you might have answered this question, but let's say if a person needs a certain item and you've got tons of them or several of them, can people come out and kind of pick and choose what they want or you all select the items that you're going to send out to a person? Hi, Pauletta. Great to meet you virtually. And thanks for sending uh, all the individuals to us. Um, we, we are not allowed, uh, we are not able to have any individuals come in and essentially shop around. That's for many safety reasons. It's a it's an active warehouse space here. And because items are first come first serve, um, and many times while we re require the healthcare provider to get involved, um, that allows us to, to find the best match. But if it's something that we have available um, and it's safe to use and it's functional, it's been sanitized, uh, we're happy to provide it, but we're not allowed to, um, not able to have individuals come in and um, essentially, essentially shop. It makes sense, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Ian. You've obviously got lots of interested folks here and I'm sure we'll be sharing it with consumers and so on. Um, Kate, did you have any last words, Ian? And then I'll just turn things over to Katie. No, thank you all again for your time and uh, time, attention and great questions. And, and thank you so much, Sarah and, and your team for allowing me to share. Sure, thank you. Katie? Hello. Um, so I can put it, oh, but that those are applause. That's not a hand up. Um, lots of applause. Uh, so I put in the chat a um, document. It's the 2022 uh, Maryland Independent Living um, Network's um, legislative platform. So last year was the first year that the legislative subcommittee of the statewide independent living council got together and um, formed uh, what we hope to be an annual document that we will kind of keep our um, priorities on. Um, it's a little more generic um, than specific and it covers kind of all, most of the areas that um, we feel uh, are um, important for us to at least have an eye on. Now, as you can imagine, the legislative session is very fast paced and, paced, and we don't have um, a dedicated lobbyist or even much of a lobbying presence. Um, but we did create this document that we could use to educate our legislators um, and elected officials about what is important to the IL network um, and what kinds of priorities we have. And then on the instant that, instance that we're able to do some lobbying, um, the Centers for Independent Living are able to do that. Um, so I was just going to share my screen. If I can find it. And I'm just going to briefly go over it and I will make sure that you all get this document um, when uh, we send out the PowerPoint. Um, so for those of you on the call who don't know um, about uh, Centers for Independent Living, um, there are seven Centers for Independent Living in Maryland. Um, we are uh, disability resource and advocacy organizations run by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. We are um, federally established. so. Um, all of the Maryland Centers for Independent Living get, get money directly from the federal government to do some of our services. And then it's supplemented by some money that goes through the Division of Rehabilitation Services, as well as other fee-for-service or um, programmatic um, funding that comes in. So uh, the Centers for Independent Living work with the Maryland Statewide Independent Living Council, which is a governor-appointed advisory council. And we come up uh, every few years with a statewide plan for independent living, which kind of details goals on what the um, Centers for Independent Living and the um, Statewide Independent Living Counselor are going to work on. Um, so what do we do? We offer, um, SILS anyway, SILS offers services to help people um, with disabilities as well as seniors live independent, 
independently at home. We have a variety of services, including information referral, independent living skills trainings, um, accessibility, uh, things like uh, home modifications or equipment. Um, we have peer mentors who are able to work with other people with disabilities to show them what is possible. Um, we teach people how to advocate um, both for themselves, things that they need, as well as how to change our um, the systems that are out there. And um, we help people move out of nursing homes or nursing facilities um, by helping them understand, apply for, and navigate the community services. So um, kind of at the top of our list is housing. Housing is uh, probably, at least in many of the centers, um, I, I can't speak for all of them, but many of the centers, the number one call that we receive is looking for housing. So um, I'm not gonna go in depth over all of these, but um, for the most part, we, we, we need to have um, an increase in accessible, affordable, integrated and safe units. Um, and we want to um, make sure that people are able to live in their um, homes and communities by providing things like case management um, and home and accessibility modifications. We want to ensure that people have, um, ha you know, have rights when it comes to fair housing and being a renter. And um, we want to make sure that some of the units that we have available are for very, very, very low income people. Um, there is a section on transit and transportation. So um, increasing accessibility, increasing um, routes and times, especially in rural areas, increasing the reliability of transit, um, increasing the ability to go from one transit system to another like across jurisdictions, um, increasing the accessibility of sidewalks, curb cuts, and maintenance, and increasing the number of accessible taxi cabs per county to 10%. Um, the next couple of ones are, are um, a little bit of one in the same. Um, it has to do with healthcare and long-term supports as well as ending the institutional bias. So um, we wanna make sure that people have what they need. Um, so whether that's um, you know, medications or treatments or um, someone to help them um, live at home in their community, we wanna make sure that people have that and that these, um, these communities that they're living in are the most integrated. Um, and we wanna make sure that the, that the places where they are, they have access to housing, transit, healthcare, um, personal attendant care. Um, we also wanna make sure, uh, very um, relevant to today's uh, topic, that people have access to durable medical equipment, particularly those on private insurance. Um, and uh, we wanna be able to increase access to rare and expensive case management and skilled nursing to keep people in their community. Um, that isn't a program that's necessarily available to um, everyone who might benefit from it. So we wanna increase access. Um, we want to increase home and community-based services regardless of payer. So whether that's Medicaid paying for it or um, your insurance company, we want to make sure that you're able to receive um, services in your home and not in an institution. Uh, we want to be, we think it's important to be able that when someone is in a facility like a nursing facility, um, so people call them nursing homes, um, that, that they're considered homeless for allowing for emergency shelter placement. Oftentimes emergency shelter placement is one of the only ways someone can get housing um, on a, a fast track. So um, being able to do that will allow someone to get housing sooner. Um, we wanna make sure that we're complying with Olmstead requirements and allow for 24 seven support in the home. It's very difficult to get 24 seven support. Um, if not, maybe impossible. Um, so we wanna change that. Um, and we wanna oppose the development and any continuation of congregate or segregated settings. So employment, um, we want to create more flexibility in the Employed Individuals with Disabilities Program. That's a Medicaid buy-in program that people um, with disabilities uh, who work are able to um, um, kind of purchase uh, Medicaid as their health insurance. Um, there's been some issues with it, and we just want to see it more flexible to meet the needs of um, the ever-growing um, population of people with disabilities who are employed. Uh, we want to increase uh, direct support pro professionals pay, um, <clears throat> particularly in the community options waiver, community first choice, and community personal assistance services. Those rates have lagged um, below many other waivers rates, and um, we want to make sure that they are seen as a priority. 
Uh, we would love to see, since about 20% of the population are people with disabilities, that we increase the state employment of people with disabilities to 20% across all levels of government. That would be more reflective of the community that um, we live in. And we want to see increased funding for the Division of Rehab Services so they can do the work that needs to be done to support people with disabilities who want employment. Um, education, of course, we want to um, be able to see that there's compliance of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and um, Section 504 of the Rehab Act. We want to make sure that um, there's sharing between public and private schools with regards to individuals individualized education plans. And um, there's been a lot of talk of the blueprint for Maryland's future, um, but we wanna make sure that that blueprint for Maryland's future and the education system includes detailed plans for students with disabilities. Um, so we have another chunk of things. It's emergency preparedness, disaster response and COVID-19 response. Uh, so one of the things that we have um, realized, particularly in the midst of this pandemic, is um, you know, not all Medicaid waivers are compliant with disability civil rights laws. And so we wanna make sure that that's happening. We wanna see a fast track system for seamless transition from the facility to community. Um, oftentimes people will be in a nursing facility ready to leave and are stuck there um, awaiting the processing of paperwork. Um, and we feel that if there is a place for them to return home to, they should be able to do that. We should be able to fast track people who have, you know, a way, a place to go out. Um, we want to ensure that people with disabilities are also included in emergency preparedness planning, not um, included after the fact, but at the very beginning. Um, voting, uh, we would we want to reinstate the automatic absentee ballot list um, without having to re-register each time and commit to ensuring voting is accessible to all people with disabilities. And this includes a variety of different methods. Um, we didn't outline there this is supposed to be a <laughs> front and back document. Um, so it's kind of generic. And uh, digital equity. So increased funding um, for students to participate in virtual learning, um, fund training in the use of um, devices, including um, you know, that for digital literacy and safety. Uh, we wanna see people be able to access low cost, high speed internet. And there's some federal programs that are aiming to do that. So that's exciting. Um, we wanna expand high speed internet access statewide and increase access to um, private independent communications and nursing facilities. Um, so that was another thing we learned during the pandemic is that not everyone in a nursing facility had the ability to communicate privately with people outside of the facility. Um, and uh, it, sometimes um, they didn't even have a phone in their room. They'd have to go to a nurse's station to use a phone. Um, and oftentimes internet wasn't working. So even if they had a device, they couldn't reach out. Um, so we're seeking to make changes to that. And with that, and again, I will send this up because I realized that was like an overload of information. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, I would yes. just com comment that, that one of the really important pieces of how this works is that if you have legislation that is important to the disability community, please reach out to us and let us know because if it falls in these broad categories, we would like to testify at hearings on your behalf, on the behalf of legislation. We'd like to meet with delegates and senators to, to help support your legislation. So please don't is, assume that because we don't describe every single incident that we've somehow left out your particular issue. Um, independent folks, uh, folks who support independent living support a variety of issues. So please bring them to our attention so that we can make sure that we get to the assembly and tell them about your issue uh, as it dovetails with ours. And my apology, Katie, for being late. I'm got COVID and I ended up sleeping right through the first 20 minutes of this program and I'll probably go back to sleep in a few minutes. So uh, I'm glad you could show up at all, Mike. <laughs> well, it was an accident. It, it was touch and go there for a minute. I wasn't <laughs> sure I would be able to, except that one of the most exciting things for me to have be able to participate in is changing law and increasing funding. We've got 
terrible situations going on in nursing facilities to this day. And we're gonna have to testify at the assembly about these issues of people who can't get out of facilities. And so they're living in dangerous situations and they're unable to move back to their homes because the Department of Health and the, and the paperwork that is involved in getting out of these facilities is so burdensome. And people can't simply get out and then take care of the paperwork later. They, they lose their standing. And as far as uh, their funding is concerned, they're just, they're people, these are life and death issues that we confront. They're not just, um, gee, that would sure be nice to have. These are sort of fundamentals to the kinds of things that we think people with disabilities need. And we're gonna, you're gonna hear our voice this uh, se session as we advocate for these issues down at the assembly. Yeah, and I would also add that, um, you know, the legislative subcommittee of the Maryland Statewide Independent Living Council is open. Um, so if, if you would like to be a member of it, um, I will go ahead and put my email in the chat box. Um, and just email me and I'll make sure that you get an invite. Um, and if that's not accessible, you can, um, uh, I guess, let me know and I can get you the information in another way. Uh, Katie? Mm -hmm. Hi, Chioke. John, did you, did Happy New Year, did you get um, my, uh, what you saw uh, uh, in the chat? If you could uh, oh, I'm send sorry. Us. Send yes, we, yeah, we're going to send out the PowerPoint presentation as well as the um, public policy platform for sure. Yes, because I would like to send that to some people. Oh, I'll great. To the places like uh, Caring Communities or Heavenly Grace. Have you ever heard of Heavenly Grace? I have not. Yeah, look them up when you, I can send it to you in the chat, there's their website and get in touch with them. Thank you so much. Work with people with this. Because, you know, my late grandmother was, uh, we were looking into having her in the nursing home. Yeah. And unfortunately, she passed. I'm so sorry. Any other questions? Or if there's any questions, I don't think there was. I don't see any more. As soon as I have the PowerPoint and the legislative platform, I can email it to everybody. Great. Um, and just, just be on the lookout. We um, are hopefully going to um, have some good legislation um, coming out of the IL network. And um, that's gonna change um, things for people with disabilities in Maryland. So just stay on the lookout and we'll hope to update you. Uh, maybe we can have a, a wrap up session um, on IAM um, in the spring. We will probably sometime around the middle of the session, late February, update you again. And, and as, as new legislation comes out that we're aware of during these I am broadcasts, we will be updating. So please stay tuned here if you want a connection with what's going on legislatively. And if your organization is supporting legislation and you need help, you need letter writing, you need emails sent, you need people to attend hearings um, virtually, et cetera, please get that word to us so that, because because it's all about magnifying our power, right, folks? It's about making sure that everybody knows what we support and it's, and it's success through numbers. It's making an impact by showing delegates and senators at a hearing that there are, because they know that every time one person is on virtually, there's a hundred people out there who are concerned about that bill. So they watch those numbers at hearings, et cetera. So please, if you have legislation, get it to us. If you wanna help with legislation and work on, on issues, please let us know. It's, it's about joining forces to make things happen. And this is a critical session because there is a fair amount of money left over both from tax revenues for last year, came in in Maryland much higher than expected, as well as, um, <coughs> excuse me, I knew I wouldn't go to last more than two minutes, um, as, well as, other, uh, as, as well as other issues that require funding. So there's gonna be the ability to get things done, but it's gonna mean raising our voices and making some noise and supporting the things that we believe in. Mike, this is Beth Wiseman. Um, Beth Wiseman, so how the heck are you? 
better than you. I am so sorry. <laughs> I think that's right, Beth. <laughs> I am Beth, so Beth, sorry. So welcome, sorry to hear Beth. that. Beth yes. is a board member of the Image Center. Welcome, Beth, to, to this meeting, and thanks so much for all your participation. Thank you. I was reading the bills this morning that have been um, filed already, and I was surprised and how many I personally, I, I'm on my own now. I'm no longer with Picasso, but um, I was surprised at how many so far I want to write letters for. And that doesn't mean that, that that Image would be concerned with them, just things that I was concerned with. One was a dental bill, um, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, I just glanced at all of them and, and kept thinking, oh my, this one, this one, this one, this one. So um, I don't know what you all chose, if you've all looked at it and chose, but um, it's a lot there to look at. There and is also, a lot. Yes. yeah, yeah. And also, I learned to, this morning that Dolores Kelly, who was such, a, who is such a supporter, of uh, issues that you would be interested in will not be running again. Um, this is this is her last term, and that was very sorrowful for me. She has decided not to run again, and Maggie McIntosh will not be running again as well. So mm -hmm. some of our real strong supporters over the years are retiring. Uh, and uh, so we've got a whole new crop of younger people coming in or different people, at least. We don't know if they're younger, but different people that we're going to have to educate. I was just going to say we have a lot of training to do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Get well soon. Be well. Well, and sometimes I was going to mention, you said something really important, Beth, because a lot of the issues that you might be interested in are senior issues. And I think sometimes people assume that we don't support those or that that's a different issue. But very often the reason that seniors need assistance is because they acquire disabilities as they get older. So, um, so if your organization or if you personally have an issue that you support that you think of as more of a senior issue, think, think twice about it and say, wait a minute, maybe the reason these people need these services are because they have disabilities, because they're unable to get out of their homes, maybe because they're unable to drive anymore, they have to use public transit, et cetera. So think carefully about it because uh, we'd love to know about those senior issues probably more than half of the people that we serve at Centers for Independent Living are over 65. So, um, you know, by joining forces, we can make things happen. Well, I say I advocate for seniors and persons with disabilities. I'm yeah. on an image. So, <laughs> so right. persons with disabilities, you know, and they do run hand in hand very often, you know. All right, any other questions, comments, thoughts? So I have a comment, hey. this is Cheryl. Hey, Cheryl. So I put in the chat a website, it's mdelect.net. Um, if you don't know what legislative district you're in and who represents you, you can um, put your address into the search bar on the top of the screen. And then on the left-hand side, after you press the search, it'll tell you uh, what district you're in, which can be really helpful for letter writing and phone calls and all that stuff. Um, and I also wanted to mention, um, so people like Dolores Kelly, um, they're still, you know, working in the legislature until this April. Um, but this year, it's going to be, you know, come April, a huge election year. Um, and there are plenty of you know, from both political parties, independents, whatever, everybody's running for everything, um, school boards, county councils, state positions. Um, and a lot of times people with disabilities think that, you know, we're too disabled to help because um, a lot of what they'll do is, is door knocking. Um, and especially if you use mobility aids, that can be kind of impossible. Um, but there are a lot of things that you can do, even from your bed. Um, they can give you, you know, 
list of phone numbers to make phone calls to people. Um, so um, don't think that you're too disabled to get involved in this process because you're probably not. Uh, so that's my pitch. Yeah, I just went and did some door knocking for a candidate who I who shall remain nameless for the moment. But it the app was accessible and it was a lot of fun uh, climbing up and down hundreds of steps and and it was before Christmas and and then there are phone call apps that are many of them are accessible. So if you're stuck in your house but you can make phone calls for your favorite candidate, all those positions are up for re-election this fall. So come one, come all, have a good time. It's an election year and we count every vote uh, and and, uh, and verify every vote here in Maryland. So you could be confident that uh, that if you vote, it counts. Hey, this is hey, Audrey. Audrey. I know we're running this short on time, but uh, I was just about to say, Audrey had her hand up. I don't know if anybody saw it. <laughs> She's good. Go ahead, Thank you. Audrey. Um, I, I had a question about uh, about the status of the adult changing tables legislation. Um, it was House Bill 10, um, I, I don't know the Senate uh, number, but it, it was in the 2020 legislation. Um, I don't think that it got through. Um, does anyone know what the status is on that? I do on not. The I know implementation the of adult changing tables. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was in a really unfortunate situation recently um, with a friend of mine. We were traveling back from Ohio to Maryland, and he needed an adult changing table, and there was nowhere. We went to a hospital in, um, in Ohio and asked them. They said no. He would have to check in um, into the emergency room in order to be, you know, have a place to be changed oh, by his mom, which was just, it was horrible. So I feel like uh, that, really, that really made me more concerned about that issue, and I feel like it's some things that um, you know, everyone deserves dignity, right? Yeah. Audrey, this is Bong. I can check on that for you because I believe that's one of the uh, bills that uh, we're, we're watching. Awesome. Thank you, Bong. Uh -huh. Mike Wallace, this is Jerry Taylor. Jerry. <laughs> is it possible for me to get a copy of all of the bills relating to people with disabilities. And the reason is uh, our veteran connections are in Annapolis as well in DC. When a lot of the issues that disabled veterans have, people with disabilities across the board have those same issues. And what I'd like to do is get that list and share it with our uh, advocates on Capitol Hill and Annapolis. So when they are pushing the veteran agenda, they will have access to the same agenda for people with disabilities. So Jerry, there's usually two to 300 bills. Um, <clears throat> we don't we don't develop a comprehensive list. I wish we had the staff to do it, but if you if you look, I'll bet you there's already a couple of hundred bills introduced and there's probably gonna be a lot more. Um, I, I think the best way to do is follow some of the bills that we highlight uh, as we go through the session and maybe send those to your, to your lobbyists because uh, I just, I wish there was a way and I wish we had the staff time to develop sort of a comprehensive list of all the bills. Uh, that that are that are going to bound to be coming up out there. Katie, did we develop last year? And I don't know whether we're going to be able this year a list of sort of bills that we're following as the session went along. Katie is not on the call. I know the Department of Disabilities was also going to do that. Uh, they used to do it all the time, and then I think sometimes uh, lately they haven't been able to uh, to at least sort of send out a list that indicates disability relationship from bills, et cetera. Do you know, Bong, whether that's gonna be possible this year or not? I am not sure, but I can check for you. All right. Sarah, you can also, once you get on the website, you can also uh, put in Veterans Affairs and you'll get a list of what's being introduced so far. But remember that they're being introduced every day. So you really, if you're interested, stay on top of it. Okay. 
All right, folks, I'm going to have to get out of here. My voice just reached its limit, I think. Um, but uh, thank you all. Hang in there. Don't get COVID. Stay, <laughs> stay safe, stay healthy, and, uh, and be well. I'm, I'm going to get out of here. And our next call is going to be on the 24th of January. And our guest will be Disability Rights Maryland. We'll be talking about sidewalk accessibility. And uh, I will send out an email with today's information when I get it from the speakers. I'll share it with you as well as uh, updated information for registration. So thank you guys for joining us and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.